Hey everyone, welcome to Beyond. Be sure to hit like and subscribe and hit the uh, the bell to be notified of future uh, episodes. Uh, today we're joined by Burke Brown. Burke, welcome. What's up, Ben? Good to be here, man. Glad to get in on this topic, man. Really excited about it. Yeah, you know, today in this, uh, this series we're in, I want to talk about legacy-driven leadership. And I think this is a really important uh, concept of our times. You know, as people get more successful in their careers, whether it be startups or Fortune 500 companies or whatever they put their hands to, um, there's this concept about legacy and how we drive our legacy. And, and why ultimately it's really important, sometimes how we're short-sighted uh, in our success and what we've accomplished and how it sort of short circuits the, uh, the legacy piece. So um, before I jump into that, I came across these really epic quotes. It sort of sets the stage, if you will, of framework, which is be known for your footprints and not your fingerprints, right? And legacy is not leaving something for people. It's leaving something in people, right? It's how you touch them at some level. And of course, uh, this one I love from Shannon Alder, which is carve your name on hearts, not tombstones. A legacy is etched into your minds of others and the stories they share about you. So ultimately, when we think about our labors and our toils and our accomplishments and our success, um, we're gonna be gone someday. We're all gonna yeah. die someday. And the question is, how do we impact the lives that we've left behind? And so that's really what I wanna, wanna jump into today. I think it's really important. But, I, but I'd argue though, uh, Burke, and I'm sure you come across this in your studies, that most leaders in the moment really don't think about their legacies until they're really approaching the end of their careers, right? Because when you're young and virile and strong and passionate and you're, you're coming across right. success, um, who wants to think about the end? Who wants to think about death at that point? So you tend to sort of live in the success sort of bubble that you're creating. Um, and you really don't give a lot of mind share towards the legacy piece. So I'm just curious to get your reactions and what your research has shown. Yeah, man. You know, what? it's so interesting. Uh, you know, we live, we think we're going to live forever and, and it's very easy for us to exist as, as though the most important thing is to build credibility, build our name, right? Be seen a certain way. And, and you know, that usually comes from some type of, you know, deep desire to belong, to be important important to have value, right? Um, and that works, you know, in this kind of capitalistic society where there is this impetus to grow and become great, this linear process of evolution, which is usually uh, measured by finance, it makes sense to continue to live in that way. But what happens is, yes, as you get older, you become aware uh, that you're not going to be here forever. And you kind of have one of two things, two options. One is to try to pretend to be young, try to continue to live that lifestyle and squander. Or two is realize, hey, you know what, maybe I need to pass the tour. And I think and I believe that more importantly than waiting till that kind of old age or till you realize that your, your sunset is, is coming is truly to kind of begin with the end in mind. You know, we say that a lot when we're working with our clients, begin with the end in mind, because if you know what the outcome is, then it gives you impetus to do the right thing now as opposed to live for the moment. And one of the things that, that I think is really important is that to keep in mind legacy is to keep in mind vision. It's what you want to leave behind. And I love that quote of fingerprints, instead of fingerprints, leave a footprint. And it means truly that you are connected to the value that you add to the, to the planet while you're here for that short amount of time. And uh, there was a question, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, he was in his car and a lady walked by and said, hey, three words of advice that can really motivate people. He put, he said, you're going to die. That's what it is. You're going to die. And she's like, whoa. And you could say she was take, taken off guard by it. But the truth is that when you know you're going to die, that makes everything that much more valuable. It makes legacy that much more important. And truly, if we can get people to start to consider how they'll be remembered more so than how they look in the moment, then really people start to shift their behaviors to make the world and the organization and the family a better place as opposed to just me being perceived as better. Yeah, that's why revolutions are sometimes often led by the young because they're, they're young and impetuous and they really don't know the big picture. And of course, they're maintained by the old who want their comfortable lifestyles on the back of others. Right, um, right. We understand that. But, you know, as we think about corporations or businesses or any success, we're all sort of built off the, the shoulders of giants that come before us. We all know that at some level. And I think, you know, if we can learn at a young age and, and quickly get that lesson that it's not forever. And it's like what Stephen Covey said, right? Like you said, begin with the end in mind and almost like picture yourself in your casket. And when you're at your funeral, what is it you want people to say about you? That's really important. So I think as a leader, uh, legacy is our responsibility. We got to think that way. I don't care if you're just starting a business and you're end of one in that organization. We really got to think about the responsibility we have to set, you know, sort of the tune, uh, the, the, the tone, the tenor of an organization. And then certainly the opportunity to, to impact future generations with that said legacy. And I would say 
However, in corporate America, I think it's been inflicted by very short-term thinking, right? It's all about if you're a publicly traded company, you're worried about the quarterly results. You don't think about beyond that much because you got to keep the stock price pumped up. Um, that's how you keep your job. And so sometimes we have that sort of infusion of short-term thinking um, mm -hmm. versus long-term planning perspective. Not, not to say that big companies that are really successful don't plan. I think, I think SpaceX is one of those, um, those incredible companies that's probably 40 years down the road knowing Elon Musk. So there's clearly planning, but I think uh, in, in sort of the lower echelons of the corporate structure, I would say that a lot of the planning relates to the quarterly results of trying to get the revenue and the plan that you promised to Wall Street. Yeah, you know, it's, it goes back to metrics. What do you define success as? And a lot of times, you know, when I'm working with my clients, I tell them, you know, what's success to you? And there's this basic diatribe that everybody goes over. It can be having this amount of followers if they're younger, if it's having this amount in your bank, uh, bank account if you're older, having this spouse. It's very specific, uh, very simple, very banal things that people desire. But the real truth is that when you are actually getting into finding out what do I really care about, and that's the work that I do, is I try to find out specifically what do you value core fundamentally. And then once we gain clarity on that, we look through that lens and they start to realize the things that I thought were important aren't important to me. That actually maybe teaching is more important than the ability to accrue a massive amount in my bank account. So what happens is when people gain clarity on their values, then they can start to create a trajectory towards success. It all depends on your metrics. And if your metrics is profit over people, that will fundamentally shape the way that you make your decisions, the way that you hire, and affect ultimately the kind of uh, the the kind of narrative or the story that people have around your business. But if you put people over profits, funny enough, that all of a sudden creates it's a massively different type of culture. And it also increases profits at the same time. So in a big way, it's so important that people take the time to step back and say, what are my metrics? And, and, and the, the answer is not defined by you. The answer is defined by the people that are employed by you. Because they'll tell you what the metrics are by their frustration or by how much they enjoy the company. So truly choosing what type of metrics is what makes it most, most important to make those changes. Uh, there's a quote that I love. It says, people don't care how much you know uh, until they know how much you care. And yeah. that, in a lot of ways, is the mindset that I come at when it comes to leadership. I'm not here to be the one on the top of the mountain yelling and say, follow me. I'm the one saying, hey, I believe in a vision and I want to make an impact on the planet. And I want you to achieve your vision and make an impact on the planet by helping me achieve mine. And so when you have that type of mentality, this energy just starts to effuse. It starts to bubble. It starts to grow and it starts to spread in a way that becomes more viral, that becomes more of a movement than just a business. You know, that's a good point. You know, when I think about leadership, I, I think it's, it's a very challenging dynamic today because we got this sort of conditioned social media response, right? Right. Um, I want what I want when I want it, right? And I want instantaneous gratification, instantaneous results. Right. And I think in leadership, it, it's, a, it's a very tough dynamic when you're a hard charger and you're young and you're trying to go up that corporate ladder. Um, it's really striking the balance about leadership and, uh, and kind of how you project who you really are. And I think um, for a lot of people, the end justifies the meetings. If you have a lot of a huge body count, right, that you walked over to get to that end point, uh, maybe in the short term, that's gratifying and you've got the money to show for it. But I'd argue in the long term, uh, that, that's very damaging and detrimental, certainly to your reputation. I would say that we've all come across somebody at some point, I would say that that was a legacy minded leader, right? That sort of had that vision that when you got around that person, they just congealed the team and in their heart and soul, you saw good, right? You saw the idea behind it's all about the people. It's all about the organization. And we may have mantras and we may have goals and strategies and tactics, but at the end of the day, you knew that person had your back, right? And I think, um, you know, I, I right. guess questions I'd ask the audience is, who in your life would you put on that list of leg legacy leaders? And if you have zero, right. that's, that's, that's troubling, right? You know, hopefully there's at least one, because I would argue that if you've identified that legacy leader, um, even if it's an end of one, that's a good starting point about mm. how you'd want to mirror your career and mirror your approach. Because I would argue those are the most effective people not only in the short run for profits, but in the long term of an organization. Absolutely, man. And I love that you're, that you're saying, you know, getting the audience to stop and think, who do I know that is a metric person, right? That is only kind of looking at 
the next body count that's looking at the next success, the next rung on the ladder versus someone who actually cares about leaving that legacy, about leaving that impact. There's something different in their demeanor. And it doesn't mean that because one is more subtle, more calm and more uh, aware of those around them, it doesn't mean that they're slower. It actually means that they're more connected to the higher goal, right? It kind of reminds me of this the here in the tortoise in, in, a, in a bit of a way. Uh, yes, when you are just going after just attacking, right, you get a lot done and that does produce results. That's a good thing. But if you leave such a, a trail of collateral damage, those results will ultimately come up to you. The cost will ultimately come, have its come up against. You're not clear on understanding that the people around me, that got every single step to cross that finish line. If I take any one step out, I haven't run a marathon. And it takes that type of mentality to understand that every step counts. Every person along the journey counts. And when you have that mindset, you, you, you value each person with the utmost care because you know that the small amount that they've done has helped me get closer to my, my vision. And in the same way, it, it almost puts a, a um, kind of, it's almost incumbent on me to make sure that they achieve what it is that they're trying to achieve. That's what I love about Jack Welch. She always talks about my job is to work them out of a job. I want to be able as a manager to make sure that this person becomes so successful that they can climb up to take my space or that they've gained enough tools to be able to do something else on their own. That mindset is so antithetical to keep a press, have them work for you. Don't let them question. What it is, is this flourishing space that you're creating. That type of mentality, that's, that's an ecosystem. That's not just an environment of control. It's an ecosystem where all the pieces are feeding and helping each other grow. That's healthy. That's right. It's very, very healthy. And I think, you know, the opportunity for leaders, for people that are following other people is really, you know, when we think about our touch to people and their touch to us, you know, are we touching people mm -hmm. at a soul level, at a spiritual level, at a deep level? Right. Because I'd argue if you go at that level with people, They'll bring their hammocks, they'll bring their, their right, beds right, into right. the office, and they'll work 24-7. <laughs> right. They'll give you their heart, soul, and everything for that cause, mm -hmm. to take that hill, right? And I think the opportunity is we're sitting there in leadership or maybe junior levels of management is really what gifts right. are we giving away every day? What you just said is really important because oftentimes in management, to keep that position, they hide a lot of the knowledge, a lot of the truths that got them there because right. they want to protect their little fiefdom. But really the opportunity is to invest, to give away, to take what you've learned and give it away and pass it on to the next generation. I think by doing that, you only embolden yourself within the organization and certainly with your opportunity. So I think a key question we should ask ourselves is how will I be remembered by the people I work with today and in the future? Because that ultimately is the legacy mindset. It's not just the moment, not just the year that I was in that startup and we flipped it, or maybe the three years, not the hundred million I made in a startup but really right. how I impacted and influenced people well beyond that startup or that organization. Mm. Absolutely, man. You know, I, it's so funny. I have like, okay, I have these, these little accolades here and things that I have. Um, they, they, for some people, they're, they're, oh, wow, okay, you have knowledge. Uh, but the truth is, these do nothing in describing who I am, right? These accolades mean nothing relative to the, the experiences that individuals have with me. I care about that more than what this is supposed to portray, right? I remember I was doing a speech when I was leaving Cal and I was talking to the incoming students. And I said, if you think for a second that this school is what's going to make you great, you are insane. The truth is in fact, that you will make this school great. That's the most important thing that people need to understand. It's the fact that you, the individual, is the most important person. That is the person that really makes anything uh, evolve or become better. So if I'm gonna have an organization, I'm not gonna say, oh, I, I sold it this amount or oh, I got this much of a seed funding. Like that's irrelevant to the incredible team that I've created. That's irrelevant to the incredible people that I have at, at, my, at my call and that can call me and with my open door policy. It's this type of switch in understanding that makes people drawn, that makes people want to be a part, that makes people magnetize towards you because they see that you believe in something that they believe in, but also they see that you believe in them. That's huge. That changes the game in a massive way. No, it's, not, it's true. You know, if I had, you know, Cal on my resume or Harvard or Yale, that's like lipstick on a pig if you think about it. Because, you know, that's great. You got the degree, but it's what you do with it. And I, do, I would argue for, for management, for leaders, 
Take a look at Elon Musk. No matter what he's touched along the way, PayPal, you can go through the litany of companies he's influenced. They all have one thing in common. No matter what the sector, the industry is, they're all hyper successful. And right. to me, every opportunity you go into, it's not, hey, look at my pedigree. I'm somebody because I went here or, hey, I was a Navy SEAL at one point and now I'm a total non-performer, but I'm just resting on my laurels. That doesn't get it done in business. People looking at what you're going to do now, especially investors putting money in a company, that's great. You have this track record. That's what they're, they're, they're really investing in, the past track record, and they want to see it duplicated in this next opportunity. But I think as people corporate climb, right? And this could be mm -hmm. in any sector, whether you're an actress or an actor or whatever you do, whatever you put your hands to, um, I think there's a dynamic tension between the you know, pursuit of power, prize, possession, right? Because we want people that love us to respect us, right? We want to show that we've made good in our potential or all those people that doubted us in the past, hey, that we're somebody now, right? And right. to get recognized, acknowledged, and set up for the vertical moves, the question that I would ask is, what do you sacrifice along the way? What part of your ethics, your ethos, and your values were compromised? And I would argue there's this, this concept that I love called the Titanic myth and why integrity matters, the integral part, right? The Titanic myth was, hey, if we compartmentalize the ship, that if we were to hit a, a, an iceberg, right, only one of the compartments would breach and the rest of the, the ship would be an integral whole. Well, guess what happened? Once one compartment breached, the whole ship sunk, right? So mm. we have to ask ourselves, what are we giving up? What are we sacrificing? Because this comes down to an emotional level our own mind, our own mind's eye and how we see ourselves. And I would say the question I'd fundamentally ask is, do you recognize yourself as you're making those corporate moves and those vertical moves? And if the people were being honest that you, that work for you, that that's come across your past. Um, and there was no potential for retribution. If they were given an honest assessment, what would be their honest assessment of you? And I think these are the opportunities as you're, you're moving up and you're feeling good about the, the money you're making. You can't believe what you're making a year or the options you've gotten is to really begin with the end of mind, like you said in the front end of this conversation, what they, I think is so, so critical, is right. to always go back to sort of a, a zero baseline of like, who am I? What is it I'm trying to architect here? What right. is my legacy really? And when I'm making these moves, can I do it with integrity in mind so I don't sink the ship? Or am I compromising all along the way so when I get to the end of my career, I'm disillusioned, people really don't like me or respect me. I, I, think, I think that, again, a, a dynamic tension Beautiful. is always underway for a lot of people in their careers. You know, you, you explain it so well, and I, and I love this, uh, the, the analogy of the Titanic. And so what I see behind you is I see those, those slots in those pictures of this beautiful epic space uh, and, and planet behind you. What I, what I want to do is I'll say that, okay, we have those slots. Those are your values, right? That's the place through which you look. If integrity, if family, if whatever it is, com community connection, whatever it is that are your values are those slots. We have about four or five of them. One of them is a little larger than the other. That means that that was like kind of your main value. And so even when I work with my clients, we have them draw a pie and what percentage of the values uh, fill up that pie of who they are. So they can be different sizes. The great thing is we have the moon in the back. The moon is the vision. The moon is what you're trying to get to. The moon is where you are trying to let me, go. Let me move out of the way. There we go. Yeah, this is perfect. There we go. So then we have then we have the planet, right? And you see the planet underneath. Your mission is to get yourself to that satellite. Your mission is to go there. So we have the values, which are the slots, the moon, which is the vision, and your process to get to that moon is your mission. And so you have to make sure that at all times your moon is visible within your values because they will automatically align. And as soon as any one of those drop, as soon as your vision kind of moves, then all of a sudden you're gonna, your trajectory shifts. And so what we want to make sure is that when people come into a space or a job or they start a business, whatever it is, or even beginning a family, whatever it is, you say, this is the vision for my family, for my organization. These are the values in which we show. And our mission is to get to there by doing A, B, and C. And when you have that clarity, you have the end in mind, then all of a sudden you will know who to pick. Who are you going to pick? You're going to pick through those values, the people that you need. You'll never reach over here. You'll never reach behind you. You're going to pick specifically through that value who you want on your team. And they're going to look and see that moon and see that vision. And they're going to help create that mission. It's this type of imagery that allows us to understand how to best approach what we want to create. And it also at the same time pulls out our own intrinsic desire to make that a reality as opposed to extrinsic, which is I want money, I want fame, I want to be able to blah, 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 blah. It's no, I have a purpose. We have a purpose. Let's move towards it.
Powerful yeah. stuff. Great imagery. Well, I'll tell you, it's powerful. And I'll tell you, integrity you know, drives right into values, right? And you say, well, what are values? And the reality in today's climate, it feels like everything's relative. And people would say, hey, maybe values change. I'd argue values don't change. People change. People move the bar. People move it somewhere else. But the values are like natural laws. And I always go back to this. So people were to say to me, hey, Ben, see that 10-story building? I'm going to jump off it. I tell that person, well, just remember, there's a natural law card called gravity. And if you don't obey the natural law of gravity, you're going to hit really hard. And they're going to come back and say, wait a minute, that's old school thinking. That's tradition. Tradition doesn't work because I'm smarter. This is the next generation. I'm progressive. And I'm going to go ahead and jump off that building. And we know what the outcome is going to be. And right. I would argue that unless you have a countervailing law, the law of aerodynamics, you're going to hit the ground super hard. So we have to appreciate that values are values and they don't change. It's like that true north star, like your analogy of the moon. And if we don't have our eye on what it is we believe in, then, you know, the, the integral whole of our ship will sink time and time and time again. And then we're, we're, we're left sort of disillusioned, like what happened? And if we live our whole life on this idea that feeling good, having the goods and looking good, mostly feeling good. And every decision I make is about the pleasure principle, getting high, getting buzzed, getting stoned, um, having someone like me or that little edgy part where I'm married, but I'm going to go dip my toe in this area. You know, the outcome is pretty predictable. And again, I would right. say just like flying, you know, you could say, I'm going to violate the errors or the laws of aerodynamics. And I'm going to take that wing. And as I'm, as I'm lifting up, I'm going to go to a certain angle of attack. And if I don't have enough airspeed, guess what happens? The wings drop, you lose lift. You know, there's just, again, certain natural laws that we can't violate. And when we do, the outcome is, is, is very, very predictable. 100%. And, and I think it's so important because people are very afraid. Of, like, once I choose my values, well, do I, can I change them? Can I not? It's understanding that when you articulate your values, they're just words. Words are only guideposts. Words are never, you know, I think it was Bruce Lee. He goes, if I point to the moon, don't get caught up on my finger because you might miss the heavenly glory. Right. Oh, that's it's good. <laughs> that same understanding that that when you create your values, it's not to say this is who I am. It's like it's 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 these four fingers that are pointing towards that moon, right? When you start to point towards that direction, you have a gauge of where you want to be, and more importantly, where you don't want to be. The clarity is important. If you want to leave a legacy, you have to know where you're going and where you're not going. You have to know who is your friend and who is your enemy. If you do not have that information, then you'll fall for whatever. You'll move towards whatever, just like you said, feels good, feels right in the moment. It's the clarity that's important. And if a person wants to leave a footprint and not a fingerprint, if they want to leave a legacy, right? If they want to become a legend in their own family organization or so on and so forth, they have to be extremely clear on what it is that they're creating. And, and a true test of that is your willingness to look stupid, to, to risk it all. You know, Elon Musk said there was a point where he had, I think it was $20 million. And he had to choose whether he was going to put money in Tesla or SpaceX. If he put all his money in one, it can guarantee its growth and guarantee the death of the other. But if he put his money in both, they could both die. He had no choice. He said, I'm willing to because they are both a part of the vision of what I'm trying to create. And he was willing to take that risk. It's not about looking good. Legacy is not about looking good. Legacy is about risking it all because you're so certain, so passionate, and so clear. You know, when we think about corporate climbers, the irony yeah. is, and, and, and very successful people, I'd say the irony is they all desire what? They, they desire respect more than anything. They want to let people know they've accomplished the um, unimaginable or that thing that people said they couldn't do, right? And I'd say, in fact, so much so they'll spend millions of dollars to get respect uh, of total strangers that could care less about what they're doing. I mean, if you see a guy drive by in a Ferrari, that's interesting, or lives in a nice house uh, in Newport Beach, that's interesting. You're not living that lifestyle. Um, but their whole, whole adult life, I'd say, is spent in the pursuit of respect. And when they look at the trailer wake they're leaving, uh, not many people, I'd argue, truly respect them if they're body climbers, I'll call them. If there's a huge body count, the ends justify the means. And these people really are respecting the office they hold um, or the title that's represented, but not necessarily the person. It's such, a, it, it, it's such an unfortunate thing. I've seen it happen so many times where these executives get to a point, and then when they disengage from that organization, they're looking around at those people, and they realize they really don't truly have friends. In fact, the people really don't want to engage them unless there's something they could do for them. And it's, it's kind of a transactional relationship. And right. So, um, with highly financially successful corporate all-stars, I would argue, Berkey, the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest obstacle is their ego. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, 
it is difficult. And I think, I think there's, there's a shift, right? As the kind of millennials have flooded the market, the, the job market to a certain extent, they, they really are about passion. They want to be a part of a company that they believe in. They're willing to get actually statistically less in pay for a company they believe in than more in pay for a company that they don't. That means that they understand the intrinsic nature of, of doing something and doing something well. Um, I think when it, when it comes to executives, and I think they're understanding more, and the research is showing more and more uh, that in order to be able to have people work for you and put their time, and there's a couple of things that you can do. Google did it well when they created their courses to people operations. That's a big fundamental shift psychological, psychologically. So they started taking care of, of their people. What happens is when you start to take care of your own, they see that you value them. When I feel valued, I'm going to be more inclined to work with you. That's just the way it is. If you put into my tank, I'm more inclined to put into your tank. And so I think that leaders are starting to understand that it's not just about being the decision maker. It's about understanding the, de the, the decisions and the, the values and the cares and the concerns of everybody that's working with you. So in order to leave legacy, you have to keep your mind on the people. You have to care about them. And it goes back to that Tao uh, proverb that I shared. It says, why is the sea king of a thousand streams? Because it lies beneath them. It's the water runs towards the lowest part. If the sage is to guide his people, he must lead from behind. It says, because he does not compete, he does not meet competition. I mean, right there and alone encapsulates what legacy is all about. It's understanding that you go below. You understand and you take those burdens and you understand the purposes and drivers of the people that work with you. You lie beneath them. And if you are to lead, you lead from behind. You're back there making sure that the vision is happening at the same time. When the decisions come, when you need to go to war, be in the front, understandable. But then it says, because he does not compete, he does not meet competition, he or she. And the reason that that is so important is because it is not a competition. It is about a purpose. It is about going to the next level. It is, you don't look at a tree. A tree isn't competing with gravity, right? It's not fighting against gravity in order to grow. No, it grabs its roots and it understands that it needs to go up. This is not a competition. This is a dance. And so one of the reasons that I say one of my favorite quotes are, goals are just excuses for adventure is because I'm not fighting to just get that goal. I want the adventure of life and I want others involved in it. And that adventure is a part of me achieving my goal. It's not just being happy when the thing is achieved, but at the same time, making others enjoy their experience and life with the successes and the failures towards moving towards the goal. The goal is just an excuse. The evolution of man, that's the ultimate goal of what I desire. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where the high comes from, right? That evolution, right. that growth, that uh, never-ending improvement, that, that, that mindset, that perspective. And, uh, right, right, right. you know, I was thinking about values and I was thinking about Theranos. And, um, you know, I think there's some specific attributes of legacy-driven uh, legacy leadership. And there's about um, six that, or I'd say five that I uncovered. There's probably, you could probably argue a lot more than that. Yeah. Um, but one is humility. And the, the idea that they understand that they don't know it all. I think this is a big challenge with CEOs, with board members, with mm -hmm. you know, high-level executives is the ego thing. And, and where I've seen the most success in companies is where a CEO understands what he or she knows and doesn't know and then brings those people in that really knows and they're expert in their, in their silos and their, in, you know, in their given areas, if you will. Um, but they understand they don't know it all. There's humility there. And they understand that success was built on the giant shoulders of others. Now, when you think about Theranos and this amazing girl that came out of, woman that came out of Stanford, didn't, didn't graduate, but she had this vision and she went out there and raised close to a billion dollars uh, worth, of, worth of funding. Right. But in reality, at the end of the day, it, was, it didn't work. It was a disaster. Right. And she kind of knew it. But here's where I think where it sort of went off the rails. It's what I'd call rose-colored glasses thinking, mm -hmm. where executives tend to put on, and we all do this, Put on rose colored glasses. Why? Because by doing that, it's sort of a psychological effect trick right. where we don't have to deal with that tough thing, that stress um, that produces anxiety. So we sort of shade everything with rose colored right. glasses, whether it be our relationships or our boss or the numbers that are staring right us, or staring us in the face as it pertains to sales numbers or that R&D projects that's sort of going off the rails. We sort of rationalize and justify and want to promote and position to the board and the powers that be that maybe it's not so bad. And I would argue that it was that that sort of undid Theranos, that she saw what was going on. The idea that you right. could have a prick of blood and you can sort of characterize all the different pathologies is sort of laughable in and of itself, but that's right. what she sold. And she held on to that belief because I believe she had that 
rose colored glass effect going on where she wasn't willing to deal with the tough, cold realities of a business. And I would argue, if we think about our personal lives, that if we sort of put on that rose colored glass on our right. relationships and we don't deal with the tough thing in an right. really honest way, it just gets worse, worse, and worse until eventually you lose a relationship, you lose the job, you lose your reputation. A lot of bad things can happen. So when I think about attributes of legacy-driven leaders, the first is humility and seeing things as they really are as opposed to what we'd like them to be. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, a, game of, it's a game of optimism and, and denial. You know, I think optimism is a very dangerous thing. People like think positive, think positive. There's a, there's a, if it's not grounded in reality, uh, then, then it becomes a dangerous thing. And so what I, what I often say is sometimes you need to be a realist. And, and that rose-colored lens, Enron had the same issue. When you set a goal that, and you're so optimistic that it can happen, when you start to realize that it doesn't happen, it becomes easier to fudge the numbers, right? When you're so certain that a thing's going to move a certain way, it actually creates denial because there is such a dissonance between what reality is and what your expectations are. And so a true leader has to be a realist at the same time. They should be optimistic. They should hope for the best, but they should be prepared for the worst and they should be in integrity with the reality. And oftentimes that, that pride that I thought it was going to be that, and I don't want others to know that it's fallen short, that comes before the fall because what happens is you start to be fraudulent. And that's where the dangers happen. That happened with Theranos, that happened with Enron. It's too much optimism, too much care on how you're perceived, and not enough groundedness to reality and integrity. Yeah, you know, really important. One of the, one of the biggest um, things I believe in the axioms is you just got to set the expectations and just speak the truth. If something's right. not right, you let people know, especially right. the board of directors who's funding the operations, right? Absolutely. You got to let them know where things are at. You got to communicate, you know, uh, constantly communicate with the board, constantly communicate with your staff, um, understand and create a culture and, and a dynamic where uncovering that ugly, hard truth is, yes. is celebrated. You know, cause I'd argue if you know, if something's really going off the rails and you know about it, you can fix it. If you don't know about it, it goes off the rails. A lot of people can be hurt. And that's again, the rose colored glasses with Theranos, right? She not only hurt herself, but lots of investors and thousands of people. Why? Because they're dependent upon a test, a blood test, to right. tell them if they had cancer or not. And it was bogus and some people died. So, you know, sometimes covering things up is the worst thing we could do. And I think it, it sort of goes back to humility, um, checking your ego, knowing what you don't know and being comfortable right. with the hard, ugly truths. Because I think people will rally around that point to help uncover the solution because there's solutions to be had. And if you think about the process that Elon Musk goes through and you right. see how fast or iter iterated, I think it was SN5 that flew. Now we're looking at SN6, SN7, yeah, SN8. I mean, that thing is just rapidly iterating. Every time it blew up on the stand, you know, they, they got back together as a team. They looked at what happened, worked together, fixed it. Yep. And they did this all publicly too, which is just such a, it's such a testament of their faith. It's a testament of their persistence and it's a testament of their vision in such a huge way. This was, it, it went viral when that thing exploded. But it made even sweeter just this thing when it flies 500 feet in the air and then lands, you're like, wow, what a transformation from then to now. That's because they're so clear on what they're trying to do and they're not worried. Now, at the same time, Blue Origin is doing everything behind the curtain. They're going to want to go for that wow factor. So you don't see any of their successes or failures. Well, actually, you, don't, you see only their successes and none of their failures. So it's really interesting the two approaches that they take. To be honest, uh, I love Elon Musk's approach because he has no concern about what it's going to look like because he's so clear on his vision and he's dedicated. Mars, that's it. It's beautiful. Yeah, you know, he's single-handedly putting Octane in the carburetor of engineering schools, space exploration, seeing how you iterate, seeing how you evolve. I mean, I, I got to believe engineering programs are going to look to him as a major case study and probably retool some of their assumptions in their own, in their own schools on how they teach and train students. Um, right. you know, iterate, iterate, iterate. I call it pulsing, right? When you're, you're developing a product, you want to pulse it, pulse it, yeah. pulse it. You want to develop it, test it, develop it, test it. And the quicker you can make that pulse happen, the quicker right. you can get to a point where you have a marketable, marketable solution, especially whether it be medical devices or planes or space. Right. Um, I think what you're seeing with, with Elon Musk is he's just rapidly pulsing uh, the designs. And it's funny to watch these YouTubers like trying to keep up with it all. I mean, right. They come out there even three times a week with their channel. And they'll, they'll get those through. Yeah, there's so much that's <laughs> happened. We can't keep up with it all. No so real, man. And I watch it all. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think another attribute of, uh, or attribute of legacy-driven leadership would be they thrive in relationship. And you talked about this earlier, uh, but they shine the spotlight on others. They, they celebrate the wins. Even the smallest of wins, maybe a, a patent was issued or 
they had a breakthrough in a design or they hit the number or marketing came up with this amazing, you know, um, whatever campaign, ad campaign, they mm -hmm. celebrate everything within the culture and they really shine the spotlight on others and other people. Right, man. It's, it, you know, uh, Jack Welch, you said giving self-confidence is one of the most important things that I can do. Um, it's, it's about infusing those that are working with you. A true leader isn't always focused on this kind of decision-making and corner office that's so backwards it's about putting vision into people it's about putting inspiration into people it's about putting confidence into people it's about giving people the belief that they have the efficacy the self-efficacy to complete a job and complete it successfully and if they take a risk and fail you reward that as well because you're teaching them how to think you're teaching them how to exist in the world if you look at evolution evolution is only failure that's it the reason that we've gotten to this place is because of the consistent failures that you, would, that you would call failures uh, in the Western mind, right? So in the same way as a leader, it is our job to pow empower people to be able to believe in their capability. It's that confidence, it's that understanding, it's creating an environment of, of reward and accountability, right? When I'm doing my behavior change work, work in an organization, I can inspire you forever. I can, I can get you so motivated. I can get you so inspired with what I talk about. I can bring all these stories. People will laugh. The session will be over. It'll be amazing. But if there is no consistency with implementation, it is nothing. It's a resounding gong. If I do not reward good behavior, if I do not reward when I see somebody live out of value, if I do not have accountability where we're having quarterly saying, hey, how are you living out these, eval these values? because we've defined the behaviors for the values. And then on top of it, not only am I as a manager checking with the employees, the employees get to evaluate me on how I'm living out those values to them. When you create that type of ecosystem, then all of a sudden people are all focused on building legacy as opposed to building their name so they can climb the ladder and destroy whoever's in their way. It's a total shift in perspective and it truly defines a legitimate success, the way that I define success, which is obviously financial because that's resources to create more empowerment, but at the same time, it truly creates a healthy existence within every member that is working top down in the organization. 100%. You know, a third attribute of legacy-driven leaders is awareness. They, they look at people in the shadows. They're not forgotten. They're not left behind, right? Even the lowliest of lowlies, they recognize them. They promote them. And they also look to help people, um, you know, in their careers who can't help, you know, they help them climb in the organization. I remember a story I heard from a CEO, super successful. He was at a gas station. He was filling up his Ferrari. And this mm -hmm. kid's looking at him like, just staring at him. And so he goes over to this kid and goes, hey, can I help you? He goes, yeah, I'm just wondering how you got that for you. I mean, what is it you do? And so they bantered a little bit, you know, back and forth a little bit longer. And then the, the CEO handed him his car and he says, hey, call me in a week and a half. And actually at that point, he went on to become a, a VC at his a firm he founded, uh, raised $650 million. Um, And so the guy called him about a week and a half later and he ended up bringing him on as a junior partner. Did wow. he have any VC experience? No, but he saw the potential. He saw the, the potential capability in this kid. And now this kid's in a medical device company as a VP of regulatory. So they, wow. you know, people that leave legacies, they see people where they're at, they see what they're, what they're all about, how they think, and they give them opportunities. This isn't about ego and my little network of people that right. I'm going to cultivate, but they go way beyond it, well beyond it. Absolutely. And they're removed and touched as people come across your path. Mm. Yeah, this is everything. It's, it's, I don't pull from the people that I just know. I pull from the values that I have, right? And some of that are the people that I know. I draw people in, but it's not just comfortability. I almost want you to be unique. I want you to be different. Uh, I, I think it was Einstein. He said, you know, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it's stupid, right? <laughs> That's it's understanding, good. right? It's understanding yeah. that everybody has a skill set. You, as a leader, you need to understand and know that everybody has a skill set. And so our job is not so much just um, seeing if you vibe with me, but to parse and discern whether this is a right butt in the right seat. Maybe it's the right butt in the wrong seat. You can start to become aware of where they can uh, flourish, where they can thrive. Another quote that I love, it says, if you look at a man the way he is, he only becomes worse. But if you look at a man as if he were who he could be, then he'll become who he should be. And so it's understanding that it's not a face value thing. As a leader, as a person who leaves legacy, you have to be able to look beyond the person. You have to look through the lens of your values, pull their values and see the potential of what they can be. And as time goes by, you get good at it because you start to parse the difference between what you hope a person to be and what you believe they can be. What I hope a person can be, that, that I'm, I'm involving myself in the judgment of that person. And what happens is I'm forcing them to become something they may not be ready to be, right? This guy reached out to the guy because the, the, the young man asked him a question. 
him asking a question is a behavior that explains or infers his value. That's why the man chose him. He wouldn't have randomly just picked that guy. He picked him because that guy moved when the opportunity presented itself. It's the ability to discern and choose. Are you a fish? Are you a primate? Are you a feline? What are your skill sets? And you start to move and you start to put it all together and you know where to place the right butt in the right seat. This is legacy. This is how you build power because your discernment levels are through the roof. And that comes with time. That comes with energy and it comes with clarity on the legacy that you want to leave behind. So true. Well said. You know, it also says that they're very secure in their manhood, right? They're not right. threatened by other people coming in. They're not right. threatened by giving people other opportunities. And that's the hallmark of a leader. One, as Jack Welch said, about getting confidence, who has supreme confidence in their ability and understands you work with and through others uh, to accomplish those objectives in a business. And right. that just says to me that, you know, I'm really certain and secure in who I am. I can reach down to another person and help them up, help her up. Uh, that's a beautiful thing. And then Another attribute I came across of legacy-driven leadership is certainly they live to serve, right? They, they really view serving others as sort of their ethos, right? Um, insane acts of kindness is what they do on a daily basis, right? And they're not looking for accolades necessarily, but it's kind of who they are, their, their ethos. And if you're really promoting people off the street in this case, or maybe in a dojo, or wherever you find these people, or maybe you come across the, uh, you know, the secretary or the person that's greeting people in the company, and you see something special in that person, right? right? Um, they really live to serve and lift people up. And it's not about them. It's not about their ego. Because again, they're, they're secure. They're secure in what they know. And they, they're secure, by the way, in their successes of the past. Um, yeah. And so again, I think it's a really key attribute of legacy driven leadership. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because one parlays into the other. Uh, you were talking about, you know, a person who is so confident in who they're, and they are in their womanhood and their manhood. They're certain they have no threat, right? And it kind of goes back to that, what we said, he, because he or she does not compete, they do not meet competition. There's another quote uh, that, and I've been dropping quotes right here, um, but this is a quote of mine that says, the man who has nothing to prove proves everything already. It's if I have nothing to prove, then I don't need to do anything to prove it right? That's true freedom. When the woman is so clear on who she is and what she's about, she has nothing to prove. Therefore, there is no threat by someone else being successful. I do not believe that it is one pie. We all have our pie. And the goal is how do I get you to take in all of your pie, all of your potential. And that's really where we start to shine as leaders, because all of a sudden we're like, how can we lift you up? How can we uh, multiply? One of the things that I always say is when I first started my coaching business and the work that I was doing, it was about addition. It was additive. How do I add to people? Then as I started to speak at a larger level, and I started to do you know, more seminars and conferences, then it was multiplicative. It was how do I multiply the positivity? First to add positivity, then multiply. My ultimate goal is exponential. That's where you create leaders, right? That's where you create people who care about legacy and not about ladders. That's where you start to uh, create programs and those people create programs and it becomes an exponential positivity. That's ultimately what I want to get to. And what that requires is that everybody must become better than me. Everybody must know more than I do. Even Christ, he said, he goes, you see everything I'm doing? He goes, you will do even greater things than these. It's that type of mindset where it's like, this is beyond. Are you serious? Like how trite, how small, how, how, how uh, uh, myopic can your thinking and vision be that the most important thing in the world is to take care of the way that you look? And if you think that you're noble in any way to say the way I look and the way my family looks, they're just as myopic. It's what am I here to do? It cannot just be, what am I here to be seen as? It's what am I here to do? We come, we go like that. Right. If it doesn't echo something beautiful, then it's a cacophony. If then, then it's just noise. What use is that with this incredible experience of existence we have? Or if it's a thud and dud, that's a bummer. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Flash, no bang. The worst. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then and the last attribute I came across for the legacy-driven minded leader is they never have the feeling they've arrived, right? They always have that growth mindset. And I, again, I, come, I keep coming back to Elon Musk. You know, when he sold his company to PayPal and made millions of dollars, he could have done any number of things and got into winery, lived a luxurious lifestyle. But then he founded, you know, Tesla and in parallel SpaceX. And now he's got Neuralink and, you know, Boring Company and probably 20 other companies we're not even familiar with. But he's never content, right? He's never reached a status like I'm the guy. And that's really, I think, a good example for us all to abide by. Legacy-driven leadership. Mm -hmm. He's touching so many sectors. And you want to talk about a ripple effect of all time. Elon Musk, and I heard 
his IQ is about 155 and Einstein's was about 160. We know he's brilliant. But the, the idea that he's put his mind to this use and is able to take that talent and have that ability with the media, because, you know, he has a very unique captive style with the media. Um, and what he's doing just from a ripple standpoint across so many different sectors, and he's transforming and changing the face of so many different um, sectors, it, it's, it's almost hard to get your brain around what the implications are. But I think what drove a lot of this, and we've talked about this before, is if, if the, the goal, like the moon behind me, is to get to Mars, then to get to Mars and live in Mars, you need certain technology. So you think boring company. You understand the temperature on the surface of Mars, you probably have to be subterranean, underground. So you need a, a way to dig tunnels. And then you need an electric car to go from point A to point B, right? And so it's almost as if the architecture of everything we're seeing on Earth is a testing bed for what's going to be on Mars. But it's, it's a brilliant thing to behold because it has so much benefit for humankind just on Earth alone. Absolutely. It is. It is brilliant, man. And, and um, I, I love it. I think it's, it's, you know, you were saying, look for the people to mentor and reflect, right? Now, it doesn't mean that every attribute of the character is what you need to take on. But if you can just see the way that he thinks in such this progressive way and, and how everything is iterative, but he's doing everything simultaneously. And really, the thing I love about it is because he's in multiple business. Even you look at the, uh, the you know, the Tesla truck, right? I could see that thing on Mars. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. It looks like it's prepared to go there. Yeah. And so when you see that, it's this, this, the vision is so clear, but all of these things that are producing out of it, they seem different, but they're all tied to that vision. And it's so funny because it ties, and I'm seeing this right now, it ties so much to this imagery that I have about the way that I want to live my life. You know, if you look at a prism, you put a white light through a prism, it refracts into a rainbow, right? The question is, what is it? Is it white light or is it all these colors? And the answer is both. When you are so clear on your vision, all these colors of how you can show up as a human being become available. And so that's the way that I want to live. I want to live my life in that rainbow. So it doesn't mean I'm just a motivational speaker. It doesn't mean I'm just a researcher. It also means I'm a musician. It also means that I love to travel. I love photography. I love my family, right? All of a sudden, all these colors all tie to that vision. So you see Tesla, you see the boring company, you see all these different things that he has, but they all tie to Mars. In the same way, that's how we want to live our lives. In the same way as a leader who le leaves legacy, he's not just focused on just the color green, right? Because that's the money. No, he's focused on red, the human heart, right? He's focused on all the colors that are involved. And so he's about leaving that refracted imagery out so that when he goes back to his white light, his soul, when we're done with this life, you're like, I lived every color out. That's success. That's freedom. That is the purpose of life, at least to me. That's a heck of an analogy. I really, really like that prism analogy. I mean, you know, we think about Elon Musk and what's going on in America today and, and the idea and the drive towards Marxism. And, and you, want to, you want a beacon of, beacon of hope and a, a, you know, a ray of light that just inspires people. Um, that's why I keep pushing for Elon, because if, if one kid in a tough part of the, of the country can see that vision and be inspired and motivated, to make the next choice that's the best choice or the better choice. Because, you know, the idea of, you know, it's funny, I, I was reading this thing on uh, the CCP in China, and the question was, can you have innovation? Can you compete with capitalism in China? The answer is no. When you're state run and there's no profit motive and the way they've architected it, there is no incentive. There's an incentive to steal to try to compete, but that's not a competitive advantage, I would argue. You really need a capitalist system where there's a profit motive. And with the product profit motive, you get the outcroppings of, um, you know, where you go help people, right? Um, you, you have a lot of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Burke? I'm blanking on it. But service. <laughs> service. And you have all these organizations that are tax-free and, you know, they, uh, they, they have all these organizations and foundations that go out and help others as a result of success. And I think, you know, it, it's a capitalistic model that spawns the Teslas, that spawns the innovation, that spawns the ideas. And so the point I'm making is you need an environment in a country that's that's conducive to that because i think what inspires human soul is not suffering um mm -hmm. is not looking at the world as so negative and dark mm -hmm. but to look at the possible i mean you don't you don't think elon musk at some points were or was in a negative dark space in 2008 when right. both companies were in the balance he had to do that last rocket shot with spacex a fourth one that was successful mm -hmm. and if it wasn't successful the company would have been no more Done. i mean Done. you don't think that guy's been through the ringer multiple times yet he keeps putting himself in that place where he's right. taking the ultimate risk. And so let that be a light. Let that be inspiration. Yeah. Let that be a, an idea of what could be for the human condition. Yeah. And that's what I hope people ultimately focus on when you talk about legacy.
Yeah, you know, I love this, man. And, and here's kind of, it's kind of cool because Elon Musk, if we, we'll, we'll look at him and we're, we're giving him a lot of praise right now, but hey, let's just go there. Um, if you look at him compared to the other car industries, the other car industries suppressed innovation, right? right. That's capitalism too. And so this is, a, this is a nuanced version of capitalism. And this is where I really want us to shine that light is to understand that, that this is about this is about capitalism tied to a vision of legacy, right? Tied to a vision of purpose, tied to a vision that is not solely profit. That's the difference. And so truly, I think what I would argue is that the highest level of healthy capitalism is where it has that service underpinning and a future motive towards something that is bigger than the profit. As soon as you can surpass, and this is one of the most difficult things in this Western society, as soon as you can surpass the desire of profit with purpose, then all of a sudden, that's when it matriculates into that healthy form of capitalism, the healthy form of success. And it all ties to what we're talking about. Great. I love how you just tied this all together. That ties to legacy. That's where the magic happens. And that's where we start to make the right choices with the right people and inspire people and lift people up because we see something bigger than a dollar. We see something that's the future. And that's the magic. Vision casting. Well, Burke, you keep you continue to make magic happen on the show. It's been a it's been a great uh, discussion today. I really appreciate your insights, your thoughts, and absolutely looking forward to next week. Sounds great, Ben. Always good, brother.